Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. Welcome to FOSS North. Um, this morning we will start with uh, Gabriel, who will talk about the reuse project. So Gabriel, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Yuan. Um, so thanks for having me here online. Um, I hope everyone is staying healthy and keeping safe. Uh, to give you an introduction, my name is Gabriel. I am the legal coordinator for the Free Software Foundation Europe, the FSFE, uh, here in Berlin. Full disclosure, um, I am not a developer. I am a lawyer. So my interest when working with free software is uh, to, to try to ensure that the rights of individuals, uh, both developers and users, are upheld when they participate in a digital society. So the more technical aspects of coding and programming will tend to escape me. And yeah, I apologize for that. Uh, the FSFE, we are a nonprofit organization uh, we, that empowers users to control technology. Uh, more specifically, we advocate for the use of free software to do that. So today, um, I would like to talk to you about uh, two of the projects that the FSFE is currently working on. The first project is called Reuse, and this Reuse project is also a big part of the second project that I will talk about called the Next Generation Internet. Uh, so what is Reuse? Um, basically, Reuse is an initiative of the FSFE that aims to make uh, reusing software code easier for everyone. Right. So. If we were all in Gothenburg right now, at this point, I would have asked for a show of hands on some questions. But since that's not really possible right now, uh, I'm going to make uh, some assumptions here about you all instead. So first, I'm going to assume that almost all of you have programmed code before. Uh, my second assumption is that many of you here have had the experience of uh, releasing code, uh, some code as free software before. And my final assumption is that almost everyone here has at some point or another been confused uh, about how to properly license their free software code. Now on this third point, um, the fact that it's difficult for people to easily grasp how to properly license their code uh, is, is a bit of a problem, yeah. In order to maintain a thriving ecosystem of free software, uh, in order to make sure that we're able to share our work, to ensure that users of your software get to enjoy uh, the four freedoms of free software, to use, study, share, and improve, uh, we need to make sure that your software is properly licensed. So what does this mean? This basically means that um, the license and copyright information uh, must be freely available for other developers to find to understand and to comply with uh, when they inspect and when they want to reuse your code. And yeah, this becomes a hindrance or it becomes a roadblock to properly reusing code and for generally just the, the, the spread uh, of free software when people are unsure or unaware of how to properly do this, how to properly you know, license uh, your code. Um, and how to properly find this information to comply with, how to properly communicate this information, basically. So some of the common difficulties that people face when they try to do their free software licensing. Um, if you look at my slide here, as you can see, my first point is where to put the information about the license that you've chosen for your software project. Now, the license that you've chosen for your software represents a freedom that you've exercised. Uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the freedom of choosing the terms on which other people can use your software. And yeah, if you've taken the effort to make this choice, if you've 
made the effort to pick a license, you would want to make sure that users of your software know about these terms. Uh, but where do you put this information about the license that you've chosen so that people can easily find it, so that people can easily understand these terms that you've chosen? So do you put the full license of the, the, the full license text into your repo? Uh, do you put it uh, in a readme file? What exactly do you do with it? Many people are not aware of what the, the best thing to do here is, and it's also not immediately apparent what the best thing to do here is. The next problem that people come across is um, what they should do if they have multiple licenses in their project. So let's take an example. Let's say that you've decided to place your code or your software project under the GPL3 license. But now you also have some documentation that's licensed uh, under, say, a, a, a Creative Commons license. So now in your project, there are two licenses. So how should you convey this information in your repo? Should you now have two license files? Yeah. So the next problem, how can you make sure that people who intend to reuse your code are aware of the license that you have chosen? So if we take another example, let's say that you have used a copyleft license to cover your code. Again, let's say this is the, the, the GPL3 license. Um, this puts some, obligation, some obligations on a person who is uh, reusing your code because the idea of copyleft, if, if we put it very simply and very hastily, um, the idea of copyleft is that someone who releases a modified version of your work has to ensure that this modified work has the same rights preserved. And so it's important that the person reusing your software uh, has the information that your software is licensed under a copyleft license so that they are informed about your choice, so that they know that they have to release a modified version of your work uh, under the same terms that you've chosen. And the last point I have on my slide here is, which license does an external resource have? Um, an external resource that you're using, uh, and who has its copyright, who owns its copyright? So being able to reuse code freely is great because we do not have to try to solve every problem ourselves. We're able to build upon solutions that others have already found. Uh, this cooperation is in the lifeblood of free software, I guess. It, it forms the backbone of free software, so to speak. So if you're facing a problem and you found out that another developer has already written code to solve this issue, um, yeah, it's a, it's a no-brainer that you would want to reuse this code solution in your own program and free software enables you to do this. But now in order to do this properly, you need to find out what license the other developer has chosen. You need to find out the terms that they've selected for their code that you now want to use in your own program. So the reuse, re uh, the reuse initiative came about because we, the FSFE, looked at these problems that developers are facing and it's clear that there needs to be a way to make this all easier for everyone. So reuse is basically uh, an, initi an initiative to help you free software developers. The idea behind it is to solve the problem of messy or inadequate software licensing um, at the very source. So this means that instead of storing copyright and licensing information somewhere else, uh, we want to store this information as close as possible to the source files themselves. Uh, if this is the case, then it would be really difficult for someone, um, for a developer who wants to reuse your code, uh, it would be very difficult for them to ignore your licensing choices uh, and your copyright information. Now, when we say storing this information close to the source, ideally, this means storing the information in every file. Practically, this means that in every source code file you have in your repo, you would have something like um, a comment header with all the practical information about your license and copyright information that you need to display. So this makes it very easy to find this information. So to achieve this, um, yeah, you can accomplish this in the following three simple steps. First, you choose and you provide your license. You make a conscious decision 
about which license you want to have to apply to your program and store the full license text uh, inside your repo. The second step is to add your copyright and licensing information to every file. Uh, usually that would mean that you add a common header to every source code file containing the relevant uh, copyright and licensing information. For files where this is not possible, uh, for example, uh, image files or binary files, uh, there are alternatives to do this that we have in our uh, reuse specifications and our reuse FAQs that you can look into. Uh, but the underlying idea is the same. It, it's to provide the information for these files as close to the source as possible and as transparently as possible. And the last step is to confirm reuse compliance. Now, this is made simple uh, with a reuse helper tool uh, that we have available. The, the tool can help to check your repository and to verify whether you have the information available for every file. Now, so right now I want to talk a little bit about the second step that I mentioned, which is adding copyright and licensing information. So as I mentioned earlier under the reuse initiative, uh, we recommend adding a comment header containing the relevant uh, copyright and licensing information to every source code file. So many of you might be asking, what does a comment header with this information look like then? Uh, and how you should display this. So on my slide here, we have, a, uh, we have an example of a comment header which you can place in the top of your file, of every file. Uh, this is an example of a good license notice and copyright statement. So from this, we can see the relevant information that you need to provide. Uh, first is your license information. So um, if you take a look at it, using, a, using an SPDX license identifier is a very good way to, uh, to unambiguously uh, communicate the license of your code um, or, the co or, or, or the license that covers the code of this particular source file. So you can get this easily from the SPDX website. Uh, they have an extensive database of the licenses and, the li uh, and their corresponding license identifier. So just pick the one for the license that you've chosen and include, uh, include the identifier in your comment header. Uh, in the example here, I've again chosen the identifier for the GPL3. Uh, so the SPDX license identifier would be GPL 3.0 or later. And then you mark it or tag it with the phrase SPDX license identifier. The next thing you want to do is to display your copyright information. So this informs you of who the copyright holder is. Now, why do we need to display this information? So copyright statements like the one that's shown, um, they're not always required by law, but in practice, it's, it's always very useful as proof or an indicator at least of what the copyright situation of that work is. Uh, I mean, additionally, most licenses will also explicitly call for you to do this anyway, to include a uh, copyright statement. Um, yeah. On a more practical side of things, uh, if you look at it from a more practical aspect, this also allows for easy traceability of the code. Um, sometimes you or others who are studying your program, you might want to reach out to the original author of the code for, uh, for legal or technical reasons. Uh, and so, yeah, this information makes it easy. So a good copyright statement should consist of the following information. Uh, start off with the copyright sign, the, the C with a circle around it. Yeah. Uh, and then the year of the first publication of the copyrighted text. Uh, this would be the year in which you created the file and have not modified it since. Yeah. Then you include the name of the copyright holder. Typically, this would mean the author, but it can also be your employer, depending on the kind of agreements that you may have in place about who owns copyright of the work. So for example, if you have it in your employment contract that anything you produce in the course of your employment, the copyright then belongs to your employer, then yeah, the, your employer is the copyright holder. And this is an important bit of information that you need to, that you need to tell others about. And finally, a valid contact to the copyright owner. 
Uh, now, a contact is not required by copyright law, but as mentioned before, it's extremely useful for practical reasons. So maybe someone needs to ask the author how the code works. You might have a fix for the author that you might want to send to them. Yeah, so basically questions or feedback. Uh, yeah, there are many different reasons for needing to contact the author. Uh, much of communication on the, uh, on the internet today still hinges on email. So the copyright holder's email address should be the first option to go to here. Uh, however, as long as the contact is easily accessible and in use for the long term, another form of contact information here would also be valid. But email is generally the best option. Um, yeah, whatever you feel most comfortable with also works. Yes. So storing this information makes sense. Um, if there's ever a need to find the original upstream of a particular file in your code base, and there are no names, there are no links, licenses, et cetera, you know, in it, then it becomes a huge pain and can get very costly. And yeah, the saying is that prevention is better than cure. That's, that's very relevant today in the current health situation, but it's also relevant for free software. It's, it's much better to put in a little bit of effort upfront to keep things transparent uh, and accountable and most importantly, orderly, yeah. It's, it's much better to do all this stuff now than to have to do some serious digging later on uh, when the need for it arises. So to help you apply these best practices, we've developed several components of reuse. Uh, yeah, so we have a helper tool, a helper, helper tool that you can run to see uh, and to check if you are reuse compliant. Uh, not only that, the helper tool can also help you to download the full text of the license you need, so you don't have to go around digging in the internet for it. Um, it also helps you to add copyright and licensing information to file headers and contains a linter tool to help you identify problems. Uh, of course, we also work on the educational side of things. So we have a tutorial that helps you understand the how and why of reuse. So uh, our materials basically help you help guide you through an example repository. And from there, you can learn how to make a repo reuse compliant while understanding the principles of reuse. Uh, we also have an FAQ that's not just for reuse and the reuse principles, but also for basic licensing questions. So if you ever have a need uh, feel like you want to understand more about uh, uh, software legal licensing, then you know the FAQs would help you out there. Uh, another component we have is the best practices that we've developed. Uh, these are available as formal specifications to make to try to make reuse a standard, so that all free software projects can apply and follow reuse. Um, yeah, regardless of the size of the free software project. And last but not least we also have a reuse API. And with this, you can quickly register your project. So it's any Git repository, whether it's on GitHub, GitLab, or an independent Git platform, uh, you can see if it is reuse compliant. If it is, it will generate a dynamic batch that you can include in your readme file so people can know that you are reuse compliant. So who is already re using reuse then? Um, of course, uh, the FSFE's repos are all reuse compliant, but uh, we've also had some multinationals that are uh, already making use of reuse. They're setting it as the best practice for their developers and for their projects. Uh, we also have the Linux kernel, which is right now 60 to 70% reuse compliant already. Uh, so re uh, Linux has added the license and copyright information as headers already to about 60 to 70% of their files. And also one of the things that we're quite happy with is that we've also introduced reuse to a large number of free software projects funded by the European Commission. Uh, these projects are funded as part of the Next Generation Internet or the NGI initiative. So yeah, if, if I could just go off a little bit on a tangent here, I'll talk quickly about the Next Generation Internet initiative. So, 
Yeah, this is an in, uh, this is an initiative launched by the European Commission. Uh, it aims to shape what the internet will be in the coming years. Basically, what it hopes to achieve is to ensure that the internet must be a platform that embodies values that we hold dear and free in that we hold dear in a free and open society. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So these values that we're talking about uh, are values like openness, inclusivity transparency, privacy, cooperation, security, and yeah, protection of data. The idea is that with these values in place, the internet can be a platform that supports human rights, democracy, and a more progressive and enlightened society. And I think these are very uh, inspirational goals indeed. So how does the NGI initiative intend to do this? Uh, what it does is to provide financial and technical assistance to individual researchers and developers who are working on new technologies or software projects that have the potential to contribute to, to the values that I previously mentioned, to these values of, the, of this new internet. Um, at the end of the involvement with NGI, the software will be made available as free software. So there are currently two actions in NGI that the FSFE is involved in, uh, nicknamed NGI Zero Pet and NGI Zero Discovery. So the pet project, it assists projects that are developing privacy and trust enhancing technologies. And for the search and discovery project, it assists softwares that uh, enhance user access to search for and discover information on the internet. So it's, it's about software that helps in consolidating databases, improving search engine capabilities, uh, stuff like that. So how does this work for a developer of free software then? So what happens is, if you're a developer of a new piece of software um, and you feel that your, your project, your software uh, fits into the requirements of the pets or discovery programs, if you feel that it upholds these values and can improve the internet in a way that uh, improves the respect of these values that I previously mentioned, then you can apply to join the program. Uh, every two months, uh, the programs will evaluate the applications and accept a new batch of uh, approved software projects. If your project is accepted, then you qualify to receive funding uh, as well as assistance from the NGI Zero Consortium. So it's, um, it's basically a consortium of a bunch of NGOs uh, of which the FSFE is one of the members and yeah other partners we have in this in this consortium assist with things like accessibility uh, security language translations uh, things like that yeah so what is our role and what do we assist them with so for the FSFE our involvement is basically to provide assistance with free software licensing uh, in particular, we want to make sure that all the successful applicants um, have that the, their license information is accurate, uh, that their licenses are compatible with one another, and that they're presented in a manner that is in accordance with the best practices as established by our reuse initiative. So reuse compliant. Um, yeah, so if you're working on a project that fits this criteria, please do apply. Uh, yeah, or if you know of any um, developers who are working on uh, software that fits the profiles of one of these programs, please do encourage them to apply. Uh, if you know of anyone who fits the bill, help spread the word about this opportunity for funding and assistance and encourage them to apply as well. I've just noticed that I've not included the website here. Uh, I do apologize for that. Um, if you're interested, please, um, I do have my email at the end of uh, this presentation, please feel free to email me directly to get more information about how you can apply for this uh, for this program. Yeah. So yes, let's get back off from that tangent back onto reuse. So yeah, reuse is free software naturally, um, and as such, you know you can look, uh, you can inspect it, you can try to improve on it. We look forward to your bug reports and your pull requests if you try it out. Uh, you can also give us feedback on our specifications and our FAQs. So yeah, please help us to become better and to, to help 
to help it become easier for everyone to properly do their free software licensing. And yeah, help us to spread the word. If you like it, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your employers. Yeah, reuse gets stronger the more people adopt it. Um, yeah, and, and the more people adopt it, the easier it is, the simpler it is for uh, copyright and licensing to, for everyone. Yeah. So yes, that is my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me directly here or contact us at this general contact here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, uh, oh, lovely, lovely. Okay, so, um, so I have a couple of questions here. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so the first one is, there are lots of compliant to, uh, tools out there, so like scan code for Solidity, ORT, doing different parts of the compliance job. Where on the compliance tool map is reuse? Um, it yeah, so, I guess I would say Reuse isn't trying to completely replace all these other scanning tools. Now, what Reuse is trying to do is just to make sure that uh, the information is displayed in a, in a manner that is uh, accessible to everybody. So it, it's trying to, to simplify the, uh, how you should properly display your, your licensing information and to put it in a manner that it's easy for everyone to uh, understand. So um, it's not so much a scanning tool in, and of, in itself. It's more a set of best practices that you should apply in order to make everything else easier for everyone else. So we do have a helper tool that helps with uh, making sure that you apply these best practices. But the tool itself um, is just a way to facilitate the best practices that we're, that we're talking about. So I, I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm so, can, can I add two licenses to my project source code using reuse? I figure it's about dual licensing a project. Yes. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Because the idea is that um, um, in your repo, when you apply the reuse best practices, then you have all your licensing information conveniently available in your repo. So if you have multiple licenses, then <clears throat> as mentioned before, the licensing information is supposed to go directly uh, as close as possible to the source. So what happens then is if you have certain aspects, different parts of your repo that are licensed under different licenses, then um, the licensing information for separate files might be different. And the, yeah. So it, the, the idea is to make sure that each individual uh, file has its own uh, license uh, comment headers with the licensing information. So if you have multiple licenses in your, uh, in your repo, then that is possible. It's just that it's displayed in a manner where people know exactly which aspects or, or, or which um, uh, segments of your, of your uh, project are licensed under different licenses. Okay. Um, how do you recommend adding years to mark the latest copyright period? Comma or so comma separated or using a range? And does reuse support this? Um, Generally, I would say the idea of having multiple years in your copyright information is um, it's a common practice, but to make things easier, uh, the, the year in which the, the last change was made uh, would be the one that we would recommend you to do. Um, I, I think that it, it supports uh, having multiple years. But of course, that complicates things for, for someone who's reusing the information. And uh, as, as mentioned before, the year in which you stopped modifying the, uh, the file and the year in which you have the most up-to-date uh, version out there, that should be the one that you, know, you put in your copyright information. 
Okay. Uh, so marketing, uh, probably done by proprietary compliance tools, uh, providers or service companies focus on risks of using FOSS rather than the benefits. So probably with that in mind, have you gotten any negative feedback from anyone? Um, not so much. I mean, I, I think uh, reuse hasn't really been as, as widespread as we, we would like it to be. So a lot of our adopters and a lot of the feedback that we uh, um, get at the moment are from people who are already uh, predisposed or inclined to be using free software, which is why, um, yeah, which is why at the end of my presentation, I sort of asked you to help spread the word because we would like this to become um, a bigger deal, a bigger standard than it is. Uh, yeah, we haven't really heard that much from any proprietary uh, uh, adopters, but generally the feedback that we have received from, uh, from those who are already, you know, inclined to use free software has been positive. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have much more for you on that front. Okay. Uh, copyright and license scanners takes forever. How quick is reuse in doing its scan? Uh, it really depends on the size of your repo. Um, so we've, we've had uh, uh, scans. Um, so we, we, we've had, we've run, scans on repos that have thousands of files before and that takes upwards of an hour or so but at the same time you know uh it it also really depends on how um uh how well the the the, the repo is licensed because um, if if every file has its comment header sort of there it, it it sort of generates and scans quite quickly, I would say. Um, yeah, and it depends on the size of your uh, of your repository, really. Uh, okay, so it, it, a personal note here is that I'm using uh, for both for Solidity and and ScanCode in my work, and uh, it takes quite a long time. And I'm not saying that uh, it depends on the uh, quality of neither of the tools, but reuse is doing quite a bit less than uh, both scan code and Fosology are doing. So it must be quicker, I figure. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is much quicker. I mean, maybe maybe I shouldn't have brought up the uh, uh, repos with thousands of files. So on a standard repo that uh, we've been scanning, five minutes, three minutes, it, it's a matter of, of, of minutes. It, it, it won't take up the better part of your day. So. OK, and that's it for the questions. So I'm leaving uh, the mic to you, Juan. Yeah, and I, I would just like to say a big thank you to, to Gabriel. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers.